Welcome back to Old School Sports. And with Out of the Park Baseball 24 now just five days away from its worldwide release, we are winding down our long-term simulation in Out of the Park Baseball 23. Uh, we're midway through our 33rd season as a general manager. We spent 16 seasons as GM of the Kansas City Royals, 11 seasons as general manager of the Pittsburgh Pirates, and we are now midway through our sixth season as general manager of the Colorado Rockies and have obviously learned a lot of lessons and gotten a lot of great feedback from viewers over the course of uh, close to a year that we've been sharing these simulations online. And a couple of weeks ago, in preparation for OOTP24 coming out, we put out a video, five tips to help build a winning team in out-of-the-park baseball. Uh, last week, we put out a video, 10 challenging teams to consider in out-of-the-park baseball 24, and in our effort to continue putting out uh, hopefully useful content ahead of the release of the new version of the game. Uh, we're coming back and doing something similar to that first video in five more tips to build a winning team in out-of-the-park baseball. So we'd definitely appreciate it if you find this video useful to go back and watch those first two videos or any of our other tutorials or Let's Play series that we have on the channel. And would certainly also sincerely appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel, like our videos, and uh, help other people find the small amount of uh, content on Out of the Park that we're trying to put out there into the massive YouTube universe. And with our intro complete, it's time to get into the tips. And our first tip to build a winning team in Out of the Park Baseball is that personalities and morale matter. Those of you who have watched my playthrough videos know that I probably spend a lot more time than others talking about player personalities. And that's because I think it's a really important aspect of the game that can definitely be neglected or completely ignored by some. And you can see the different player personality characteristics here. I have them separated into the three that I think are the most important, work ethic, leadership ability, and intelligence, and the three that I view as somewhat less important, which are loyalty, greed, and adaptability. When all else is equal, I'm looking for players who are as good in these all of these personality ratings as possible. You can see we're looking at our pitching staff right now, and we've got a lot of high work ethic pitchers. And work ethic to me is probably the most important rating because players with high work ethic can have a positive impact on the clubhouse. They can have a positive impact on the development of other players. And players with low work ethic are also more susceptible to drug suspensions. So something that you would prefer to avoid if at all possible. They don't happen frequently in the game, but anything you can do to stack the digital odds in your favor is a positive thing. Similarly, leadership ability I want as high as possible. Uh, leaders can have a positive impact on the performance and development of others clearly very important and you're also going to often see players who have high leadership abilities who also have that captain personality which can be very helpful to have and then intelligence to me is the third of the really important categories players with high intelligence can have a positive impact on the clubhouse they can have a positive impact on in-game decision making they can have a positive impact on player development and similar to work ethic, players with low intelligence are also more susceptible to getting uh, hit with drug suspensions. And I did mention that loyalty, greed, and adaptability, not quite as important to me. Uh, just a quick summary of what they generally mean. Loyalty to me is how likely is the player to stay with you when their contract is up. Greed. How many dollars is it going to cost for that player to stay with you when the contract is up? And then adaptability. 
how effective is this person going to be at learning new positions or taking on unique circumstances? So those three categories are still important, all else being equal. I want high loyalty, high adaptability, and low greed. Uh, but to me, work ethic, leader ability, and intelligence are really where you're going to get the most bang for your buck. Player morale is also important, and you can see a summary of the player morale for all of your players on this screen. Um, you can see that morale overall is pretty good. We do have some tough areas, and uh, what we found with this team is that we've got a really good starting rotation, but we do have some very talented pitchers like Will Lucio, who's angry with his role on the team, and Elijah Smith, who's very unhappy with his role on the team, that would prefer to be starting pitchers. Um, so those are negative aspects in terms of how they're feeling about things, but you can see that overall, both of those players even are still generally pretty happy with the way that things are going. But it's not just your major league teams where you need to care about personalities and morale can also do with your minor league teams. And I would argue that for your minor league teams, the work ethic, leadership ability, and intelligence, those three categories that we talked about that can ultimately contribute to player development are even more critical because the minor leagues are where probably 90 plus percent of the player development that is gonna occur in your organization is gonna take place. So you can see here, looking at our high A team, the Spokane Indians, work ethic, the majority of our position players have high work ethic. Leader ability, we've got several players with high leader ability. And intelligence, we've got a number of real high intelligence players. And you'll notice that in work ethic, leadership, and intelligence, we don't have anyone on this minor league team with low skills in those traits. Uh, loyalty, a lot of high loyalty people, although we do have one lower loyalty in the system. Greed. A lot of normal people and then low greed which is a positive trait and then adaptability we've got a fair number of highly adaptable players so you can see on this entire roster of 18 position players on the team we've only got one negative trait among all of those players and that's because as i mentioned the player development mostly happens down in the minor leagues and when we start getting to the later rounds of the draft when I'm in the 15th, 16th, 17th rounds of the draft, the chances of those players ever making the major leagues are probably in the single digits percent wise and probably lower than, you know, probably low single digits, if not below 1% for some of those players. So a lot of times in the late stages of the round, I'm just looking at the late stages of the draft, the late rounds of the draft. I'm just looking for players with good personalities to put her through my minor league system. And even if they're never going to be a major league player, hopefully they will be a positive influence on the development of the players that they play with over the years who really are major league prospects. And all of that talk about personalities and morale bring us to our second tip, which is don't ignore chemistry and staff cohesion. You can see we're on our team chemistry page here. Uh, notice right from the start that our team chemistry is ecstatic. You can see the summary ratings of all of those pitchers we were looking at, as well as our position players. And it's generally a pretty cohesive team. Nobody has any complaints. Our manager generally has good relationships with most of the team. We do have a couple of key pitchers that he happens to have a bad relationship with, which is not optimal. Uh, we've got three players with the captain personality. We've got a number of leaders. And as far as the negative traits, we've got nobody who's disruptive, nobody who's selfish, nobody who's unmotivated. We do have a couple of outspoken players uh, in left fielder Robbie Carrillo and right fielder Bobby Perez. They also happen to be two of the best offensive players on our team. So when I say that personalities matter, that doesn't mean that I'm not willing to have someone who has a few flaws in their personality on the team. They've just got to make up for it by being a very productive player. And in the case of Carrillo and Perez, uh, they both fit the bill on that front.
And similar to team chemistry on the coaching front, staff cohesion definitely matters. And quite honestly, although content staff cohesion is not bad, this is kind of as low as I've ever seen it for this Rockies team. I've got a lot of, um, not a lot, but I have other tutorial videos out there that get into how to build a coaching staff. So if you want a lot more detail on this topic, definitely can recommend checking that out. But essentially, in addition to building a coaching staff with the highest quality coaches possible, who have as good relationships with your players as possible, and are as good as teaching those players as possible, you want players who gen or coaches who generally work well with one another. So you want people who get along and there's some synergies, and you want to try to avoid the number of. Um, coaches you have that struggle with the personalities of one another. You can see right now our scouting director is the one who uh, causes most of the issues. He doesn't get along particularly well with our manager, our new pitching coach, or our hitting coach. Uh, fortunately, the scouting director is often on the road, but he's likely the source of the fact that we only have average staff cohesion at this point. But Chemistry and staff cohesion are definitely two things that you don't want to ignore. If you feel like you've built a great team on paper and it's just not performing as well as you think, I think if you go and you look at things like chemistry and staff cohesion and personalities and team morale, you may find that there's some adjustments you can make, getting rid of a couple of malcontents, changing a coach, ensuring that someone who's been promised a certain role is getting to perform in that role that can ultimately um, get your team performing better on the field. So would definitely not ignore chemistry and staff cohesion. And tip number three is to think about home field advantage. Baseball is a somewhat unique sport in that the size of the playing surface, the type of playing surface, the wind, the atmosphere, the distance to the fences, the size of the fences can all be different in each park. You think about old Yankee Stadium and wanting to build a team with left-handed hitters to take advantage of that short porch in left field, as well as left-handed pitchers who would encourage the other team to have right-handed batters that could be hitting out into that spacious right center field area and hopefully having a great defensive outfielder like a Mickey Mantle or a Joe DiMaggio in center field to track those balls down. You think about Fenway Park and the Green Monster. Build a team with a bunch of right-handed hitters to be knocking singles and doubles and triples off of that wall and also hitting home runs over it. So in this playthrough, we've had the uh, distinct privilege and pleasure of playing in Coors Field, which is definitely one of the more esoteric ballparks out there. Everyone who follows baseball knows that since baseball started play being played at the MLB level in Colorado 30 years ago, there have been a lot of home runs flying out in Colorado ballparks, uh, thanks to the elevation in the thin air. But if you look at this, the percentage of doubles and triples are even higher than the home runs. Doubles are 27% above average, and triples are 94% above average in Coors Field. And that's because it's a huge park. Uh, you can see it's about 350 down the lines, 375 and 390 in right and left center, and 415 out to center field. And all in all, the fair territory in Coors Field is about a third of an acre larger than it is in Fenway Park. So because of that, you've got a lot of expanse in the outfield, and you're going to likely want to have some pretty fleet outfielders out there to cover as much territory as possible. And this is also a park where, although I would say that contact and home run power are universally viewed as two very important batting ratings and gap power is somewhat less important in the eyes of most 
course field is a park where if you've got somebody with really good gap power and really good speed they could be hitting an insane number of extra base hits for you so after thinking about Coors Field I've started to try to build a pitching staff that I think will be successful in Coors Field and clearly we know that there's going to be a lot of home runs hit in Coors that's the history of the park the numbers that we were just looking at show us that that is a fact so we've built a pitching staff with pitchers who all have average to well above average and in some cases close to exceptional movement on their pitches to hopefully limit the perfectly hard contact and the number of home runs that they're going to give up and we've also built a pitching staff that's got a ton of pitchers with extreme ground ball or ground ball tendencies to try to keep the ball on the ground to ensure that the, we're not allowing a lot of line drives into the gaps of that outfield because it is so expansive out there. Clearly, there's going to be ground balls that get through the infield and become hits regardless. But building a team of pitchers with really good movement and ground ball tendencies is one way that I've tried to tailor the team that I've built to the ballpark that they're playing in to ensure that we win as many games as at home as possible. And this year, the uh, Rockies are 28-15 and 15 at home, about midway through the season. So they're doing really well so far, thanks in a large part to the pitching staff that we've built. But it's not just about pitching when you're thinking about building a team that fits your ballpark. And that brings us to our fourth tip, which is that defense matters. And if you take a look at uh, the 14 position players that we have on our roster here in Colorado, you'll see that for their primary positions, they all have very good defensive ratings. But you certainly have to go deeper than just the broad defensive rating to figure out exactly what you're dealing with. Catching is a very important position in OOTP. Uh, catcher ability, to me, is more critical than catcher arm. And there's certainly people who have um, put out much more on this than I ever have, notably Sergeant Mushroom. But even though catcher ability has been nerfed a bit in OOTP 23 compared to what it was in OOTP 22, I think it's still critical to have catchers with excellent catcher ability, if at all possible, to help those pitching staffs be as proficient as possible. Turning to the infield, we've talked about the fact that we want to have a lot of ground ball pitchers in Colorado. Well, if we're going to have a lot of ground ball pitchers, we're going to need some good infield defense. And our starting shortstop against right-handed pitchers is Jordan Casares, who has excellent ratings in range, error, arm, and turn double play. You know, your prototypical excellent defensive shortstop. Uh, we also have Israel Mays on the team. He's our shortstop against left-handed pitchers. He plays third base against right-handed pitchers. He's got very good solid ratings for a shortstop. He's got, in terms of his range, an excellent rating for a third baseman in terms of his range and error and still a pretty good arm. So he's a useful guy to have around. Our starting third baseman against left-handed pitching, not as dynamic of defensively, but still above average range, a really good error rating, and an excellent arm. Our starting second baseman, Danny Ruiz, in a perfect world, I'd love him to have higher range and error ratings than he does, but he is still a more than competent defensive second baseman. And then we've also got a utility infielder in Juan Castillo, who has a similar profile into Ruiz well above average in all the defensive categories and the ability to play second, third, and short. So in the event that the players who are regular lineup participants uh, need a day off or get banged up, we're not going to have a huge drop off in the defense that we're putting out there. Turning to our outfield, I mentioned earlier that the dimensions at cores are very conducive to extra base hits. So we want to have outfielders with as good range as possible. Our left fielder, Bobby Carrillo, Robbie Carrillo, is a former center fielder. His range is down to 60 as he's gotten a little older, so definitely would be a, um, 
unexceptional center fielder, but still with a 60 range and a 75 error rating is a pretty good defensive left fielder. Eddie Farley is our center fielder, has excellent range in outfield error ratings, covers a lot of ground out there, has won a gold glove before. And then Bobby Perez in right field is above average in his range, well above average in his error rating, and has an absolute uh, cannon in the outfield, you know, a Roberto Clemente or Jesse Barfield type arm out there. So we've got three good defensive outfielders. I'd say one exceptional defensive outfielder in the case of Farley among our starters. But then our backups are perhaps even better defensively than some of our starters. Angel Gomez has 65 range and a 65 error rating. So he is certainly someone who can back up these guys well. And then Hector Rivera is an outstanding defensive outfielder, the 26-year-old. So in the event that Carrillo, Farley, and Perez are hurt, we've got players behind them who are just as good, in some cases perhaps even better defensively, to ensure that we're continuing to provide excellent defense behind our pitching staff with a lot of range to hopefully ensure that we're tracking down as many of those fly balls and line drives in the big outfield as we possibly can. And going back to the third tip about home field advantage, other teams who have a poor defensive outfielder in left field are going to be at a particular disadvantage when they're playing in our big park. And you've probably noticed that I haven't mentioned first base yet. Uh, that's because it's probably our weakest defensive position, but it's also probably the least important defensive position. Uh, Elijah Moore is competent, more than competent at playing the position, but his actual defensive ratings are average to below average. But Elijah Moore is a player who is um, halfway to leading the National League in home runs for a third consecutive season has a great bat. He's finished second in the MVP voting each of the last two years. And you can see he's also a player getting back to personalities whose intelligence is not that high. So he's poor defensively and he's not that smart, but he's an incredible hitter. And, you know, those are the kind of trade-offs that I make and you need to make. I'm not saying that everyone on my team is going to have a perfect personality and that everyone on my team is going to be great defensively. Uh, but those are the kind of trade-offs that you need to make to build a winning team. Adam Fields, who is our primary DH, is also a first baseman by trade. You can see defensively he's even a little worse than Elijah Moore, so he doesn't play out there much at all. But another player who is an excellent bat. Uh, hit over 300 last year with 46 homers, 138 ribbies. He's got low adaptability and no personality, but we're happy to have both of those players on our team despite some of their defensive shortcomings and their personality shortcomings because we're playing them at what's probably the least important defensive position, and they both have incredible bats that more than make up for their defensive deficiencies in my view. So in a perfect world, obviously you want defensive players with better range, better error ratings, better arm, better turn double play ratings, all else being equal to help your pitchers. But there's an understanding that there's trade-off in all of these things. My only point with this suggestion is to think about your ballpark, think about the type of defensive characteristics that might play most well in your ballpark and give your team and your pitching staff the most support possible. And when everything else is equal, go with a player who's also going to bring something to the table defensively and not just offensively. And our fifth and final tip is to get creative with contracts. And you've got a lot of options on the contract screen. I tend to like to play as a general manager, so I spend a lot of time thinking about contracts. But if you're someone who prefers the manager aspect of the game, there's a lot of things on this screen that can get you into some trouble, and I'm going to talk about a few of them here. Starting pitcher Dave Alvarado is the cornerstone of our pitching staff, a player that we picked up as a free agent signing after our first year as GM in Colorado. You can see we signed him to a seven-year deal for $168 million. 
So his average contract with us was $24 million a year. And you can see as we're getting to the end of this contract, he's making $22 million this year, $20 million the year after that. And then he's got an option for $20 million in the final season of the contract at age 36. So this was obviously a front-loaded contract because the average is $24 million a year. So we paid him more money in the early seasons of this contract, less money in the late seasons of the contract. Depending on what the other contracts on your team look like, depending on what your payroll is, there's certainly reasons to front-load contracts and back-load contracts. So just be cognizant that you don't need to, if you're signing someone for five years, $50 million, you don't need to give them exactly $10 million every year. You can get creative, and uh, particularly if you are a team that is facing salary and budgetary considerations, which is most of the teams in baseball, and ultimately at some level all of the teams in baseball, getting creative with the structure of the contracts in terms of the timing of the money can give you a small advantage in terms of being able to build a team that's going to be competitive. Another one of our starting pitchers is Jose Vasquez, who we picked up in a trade with San Diego in 2051, and then we signed him to a six-year $89 million extension after that season. So his average is about $15 million a year. And you can see, though, this year he's making 12, next year he's making 15, and then we've got team options at 18 and 20 for the last two years of that contract. So for the average on this to be just below 15, he was not making big money in 2052 or 2053 either. So this is a backloaded contract where we got him for lower money in the early years, and these later years when he's making the big money, we've got a team option. So if his performance drops off by an extreme amount, if he suffers a significant injury, if our budget gets cut and we just find ourselves in a position where we've got to dump some salary, we've got some options to get out of the big years of this contract. So this contract, in a way, is the exact opposite of the contract we just talked through with Alvarado and that this contract is backloaded as opposed to Alvarado's contract which is front loaded and uh, just goes to show that depending on the budgetary situation of a team when we brought Alvarado on board we wanted to spend a lot of the money up front to make his cap number or not his cap number but his number as far as the amount of money we can spend on salary lower in the future years and that potentially helped open up some of the money that we used to bring on jose vasquez in this backloaded contract with team options at the end of it and when you're actually getting to the screen to sign players to contracts particularly if you're more of a manager than a general manager this is an area where you can definitely make some mistakes all else being equal, if it's a player that you want to get signed and on your team, you want to make sure that a deal gets done, but you want to build a deal that is most advantageous to your team as possible, which typically is going to involve spending as little money as possible, structuring that money in a way that makes sense for your team. You can see that Chase Roadrunner Crawford is actually proposing a front-loaded contract to us you got to pay real close attention to the options, uh, option types, which can be applicable for the final two years of a contract, can be team options, player options, or vesting options. If at all possible, you want them to be team options, so you maintain the control, particularly when a player is getting older, and if because of injuries or just regression in their performance, the contract turns horrible, team option will allow you to get out of it. Player option obviously gives that option to the player. If a player is still great at age 38 and he's going to make $15 million from you and he can probably get $30 million on the open market, if you've got a player option in the contract, you've given him the option to get out of the, the deal. Investing option, 
is uh, a lot of choices here in terms of games started, innings pitched, games finished when talking uh, about pitchers, different options, obviously, for position players. Something to be careful with. Um, you can sometimes get a player to sign um, for different amounts or different amount of years if you give them a vesting option at the end. Uh, but you want to have a good sense of whether that option is going to vest or not and whether you want that option to vest or not when you're making those decisions. Similarly, the additional clauses, and this is an area where you can get into a lot of trouble, um, would prefer to not have player opt-outs in the contract. Um, players would like the idea of signing a 10-year deal where three years in if the market has changed significantly or if they've improved a lot they can get out and go get more money on the free agent market so you want to try to avoid those if at all possible no trade clauses you know preference would be to avoid that to keep the optionality if you want to move on from the player and then promised role is one where you can get into a lot of trouble and this is something else to think about if you're having morale problems um, personality issues chemistry issues on your team and your team is underperforming it could be because you're making promises that you haven't kept and there are a lot of pitchers out there who want to be promised a role in the starting rotation and a fair number who want to be promised a role as a closer and if you look at your pitching staff and you've promised nine pitchers that they can be in the starting rotation and three pitchers that they can be your closer, you're going to have a lot of pitchers who aren't playing in the roles that they think they were promised when they signed that, when they signed that contract. And that can lead to a lot of morale issues and ultimately some difficulties in your clubhouse that could result in a weaker performance on the field and players who are asking for trades or unwilling to re-sign with you after also potentially damaging your clubhouse feeling for a number of years. So for a lot of pitchers, this is going to default to a starting role or a closer role, and you just need to make sure that when you're making a promise to somebody that it's something you intend to keep because otherwise that can definitely lead to some hurt feelings in some angry players. Similarly, getting into incentives, uh, this is an area that's not going to get you in a ton of trouble generally, but if you offer people huge bonuses for goals that they can potentially attain or big bonuses for All-Stars, Cy Youngs, and MVPs, just keep in mind, particularly if you're playing a team that is uh, one of the lower budget teams in baseball that at the end of the season you could be paying out millions of dollars in potential bonus money which is likely going to limit the amount that you're going to be able to spend for the next season so just be careful with all of those things i think options and promised role are probably the two most important but the additional clauses as well as the incentives are all things to pay attention to and then the dollars you're paying and whether you're front loading a contract even money throughout the contract or backloading the contract are all things that you can do contractually that can make your team more competitive for an extended period of time. And with that, we're done with the five tips to hopefully help you build a winning team in out-of-the-park baseball. Number one, personalities and morale matter. Number two, don't ignore chemistry and staff cohesion. Number three, think about home field advantage. Number four, defense matters. And number five, get creative with contracts. And I think that if you keep all of those things in mind as you are building your team, you can definitely make changes that will change the number of games that you're going to win over the course of the season. Are following these tips necessarily going to turn you from a 70-win team into a 100-win team? Probably not. But you can definitely make some changes in some of these uh, aspects that are going to get your team a few more wins over the course of the season. And that can mean making the playoffs or not making the playoffs. That could mean having a winning record versus having a losing record. That could mean keeping your job for another year versus getting fired. And ultimately, it can mean winning a World Series as opposed to getting bounced earlier in the playoffs. So I think that all of these things are things to keep in mind 
and hopefully help you build a more competitive and a more winning organization in out of the park baseball. And we will be back with more tips and tutorials down the line. Until then, thanks so much for watching and hope you have a great day.